All right, what's going on guys? Using Actions here, and today I'm going to be discussing and giving you some backstory into Outlast's characters. His characters are actually quite interesting and very in-depth compared to other horror games, such as Outlast 2, where the characters are very in-depth, the story crazy in-depth. If you guys want to check out my lore series for Outlast 2, you can click the tab popping them now. But anyway, let's get into talking about the characters in Outlast. First, of course, we have Miles Upshear, the investigative reporter and the main protagonist of Outlast. Miles originally worked as a regular journalist for an unknown company before being fired as a result of posting unacceptable material regarding the situation in Afghanistan. Since then, Miles has been self-employed as an investigative journalist. Prior to departing to investigate Mount Massive Asylum, Upshear lived in an apartment in Washington, D.C. And that is about all we know about Miles Upshear. His age is around early to mid-30s. He's a male. And his height is around 6'1 or 6'2. And now moving on to Mr. Chris Walker, or as I like to call him, Chrissy Poo. A document states that Walker's predominant fixation is a maniac exaggeration of military security protocol. He claims the flesh ripped from his forehead allows for a truer vision, much like the Tuatara and their third eye. The removal of his nose and lips was a result of self-mutilation due to extreme anxiety. He's responsible for the deaths of various people inside the asylum, employees, and patients alike in an attempt to contain the Wall Rider, which Father Martin is trying to set loose upon the world. A note reveals that before being admitted to Mount Massive Asylum, Walker was an ex-military police, as well as having toured Afghanistan several times. Prior to being committed to Mount Massive, Walker was hired as a security guard for Murkoff after returning from Afghanistan. Despite his stature and almost inhuman strength, Walker had a childlike mind. He became surveillance officer for the Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic in Texas. There he was named Strong Fat by his colleagues, which he despised. At some point, Walker's psyche broke. He murdered three inmates, all war veterans. When the bodies of his victims were found, they had been brutally ripped apart. Two Murkoff agents named Pauline Glick and Paul Marion investigated the murders without involving the police. Eventually, they discovered that Walker was behind them with a fourth victim, Dr. Claymore, had been found in a therapy room. Realizing that this should have been recorded on the security monitors, they visited Walker's control room. However, the monitors have been smashed, and since only two people had access to the monitors, including Claymore and Walker, they figured that Chris was the one responsible. They headed to Chris's residence, but he was not home. They found four cooler boxes, three of which contained the heads of Walker's previous victims. When they discovered that only one of the boxes went empty, they realized that he was bound to arrive home soon and so they waited for him. Meanwhile, they searched the house and found his childhood toy, a stuffed toy pig. This also explains why he calls you Little Pig in the game. Little Pig. <laughs> Shortly after, Walker arrived home with the head of his last victim. The officers immediately drew their guns and ordered him to stand down. However, seeing the investigators holding his stuffed animal, he lashed out at them. He threw Pauline to the ground and grabbed Paul by the throat. Pauline shot him several times in the face, scarring him horribly. In response, Walker dropped Paul and instead of attacking Pauline, threw her out the window. Before Chris could kill her, Paul grabbed his gun and shot Chris several times only for Chris to knock the gun out of his hand and throw him to the ground. As he approached Paul, Pauline got in her car and drove at Chris, the impact throwing him against a rock and knocking him unconscious. Afterwards, Walker was apprehended by the two agents. As he was a Murkoff employee, the killings were blamed on another patient, Omar Abdul Malik, who received a life sentence in prison. Walker, however, was not surrendered to the police, but was instead committed to Mount Massive Asylum for experimentation. Two months later, Pauline was called to the asylum where she met Jeremy Blair in the underground lab. Blair showed her Walker, who was not recognizable as a human anymore, and had been turned into a beast and encountered in Outlast. Some more about Walker, he was born around 1978 or 1979. He was 34, he died September 18th, 2013, dismembered by the wall rider and he is quite large at a height of six feet eight inches a big flipping dude now we are going to talk a little bit about father martin a note found by the player describes a patient called father martin who has begun suffering from delusions of a higher calling after the asylum's art therapy program is done away with the quotation marks around the word father in the note amplify that his statue as a priest is questionable this origin is hinted at by the cross on his chest that appears to be fashioned from straps and at times a buckle is visible his religion worships the wall rider. His past experiences with finger painting may have led him to mark the path for miles and blood in the form of writing 
lighting, arrows, smears, etc. And then of course he died on September 18th, 2013, being crucified. And now we have one of everyone's, I'm sure, his favorite character while playing this game, Richard Traeger or Dr. Traeger. Prior to his involuntary commitment, Traeger was the head of business development at Mount Massive Asylum. Prior to the events of Outlast, Pauline Glick and Paul Marion are called to investigate an HR complaint at Mount Massive. When the Pauls meet Traeger, he's claiming to be a team player and wanting the two of them to be on the team Rick. Rick also harasses the female investigator multiple times. During the conversation, Marion secretly signals to Glick that he considers Traeger to be dirty as hobo shit. To get more information, Glick asks Traeger whether the two of them can meet for dinner. Traeger accepts. While dining at a restaurant, Traeger explains that as a child his father tried convincing him not to become a doctor. Afterwards, Traeger drives Pauline back to his place where he offers her cocaine. When she declines, he offers her scotch, which she also declines in a favor of red wine. While Traeger is busy getting the wine from his cellar, Pauline searches his house and finds Traeger's internet password, magazine guides on how to perform surgery, and a pamphlet for an abortion clinic. While drinking, Pauline recognizes a sour taste and realizes Traeger had poisoned her. Pauline responds by pulling her gun on Traeger and points it at his genitals, forcing him to drink the rest of the drug scotch. Traeger passes out almost immediately. Pauline then calls Paul to pick her up in Traeger's house. After leaving Traeger's house, Pauline calls Paul and the two confront pregnant Murkoff employee Michelle Haas as the source of the leaked information. Michelle reveals that Traeger raped her and got her pregnant. Traeger had then forced her to either get an abortion or to get fired. As she could tell no one without the risk of Traeger firing her, she could not take care of a child without her job. Michelle had decided to send the email with the hope that Traeger would be blamed and fired. Paul then made sure severance package was made for Michelle in exchange for her silence. This way Michelle was able to keep her child and would be able to take care of it without working for Murkoff. Michelle agreed, but then she was visited by Jeremy Blair with the investigators to revoke her security clearance. A furious Traeger stormed into the room calling the two investigators lying bitches. Claiming that Michelle could not prove anything, he grabbed a pair of scissors from a nearby table and viciously stabbed her in the stomach multiple times, severely wounding Michelle in the process. Paul then attacked Traeger and took him to the ground. In the scuffle, Traeger accidentally stabbed himself in the leg with scissors, and Paul Pauline subsequently grabbed Traeger by the neck and ran his head against the paper shredder, ripping out his long hair and scarring his scalp in the process. Afterward, Traeger was apprehended and taken as an inmate and used for a test subject in the morphogenic engine. Despite having been his friend, Blair personally watched when Traeger was dragged into the machine kicking and screaming and smiled sadistically while watching. During the Mount Massive Asylum incident, he improvised himself as a surgeon and started cutting up staff members to cut corners. Some more information about Traeger, he died on September 18th, 2013. He was crushed by an elevator while chasing Miles. He was about 6 feet tall, had gray, partly balding hair, and he had brown eyes. Next character we have here is Rudolf Wernicke or Dr. Wernicke. Dr. Rudolf Gustav Wernicke is one of the researchers who worked in the hidden research facility beneath Mount Massive Asylum. He's also one of the more prominent figures behind Murkoff psychiatric systems. He was the main scientist behind the whole Wall Rider experiment. Rudolf Wernicke was born on the 20th of October 1918 in Munich, Germany, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, and achieved fame in the mathematic and scientific communities for a paper written by early computing pioneer Alan Turing. After a cloudy history with the German war effort, he immigrated to the United States in 1949 with a visa from the State Department. Several decades of government research in Los Alamos led to New Mexico where Dr. Warnicke retired to pursue landscape photography and care for his cats. He is single and has no children. He came to Colorado shortly after the turn of the millennia to pursue charitable work for the Murkoff Corporation. And at the time of Outlast's release in 2013, that would have made him 94 years old, and it is unknown if he is still alive or not. And the last character we're going to be talking about today is the Wall Rider. The Wall Rider, also known as the Swarm, is the final enemy encountered in Outlast. It is the source of the madness that seems to inflict most of the Asylum's inhabitants and the deity of Father Martin's religion and his followers. While appearing ghostly in nature, the Wall Rider is actually a swarm of nanites, small nanoscopic machines which collectively possess great strength and power. It took possession of William Billy Hope. When Billy was undergoing morphogenic engine therapy, he learned to self-direct lucid dream states he was then capable of controlling the Wall Rider. And I didn't know this, and I didn't think this either, but 
it turns out the wall rider is about 6'8", so uh, as tall as Chris Walker basically, and I did not know he was that tall, so the yeah, very, very large thing. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know that Outlast just seeing the game and just playing it as a horror game, it doesn't really go into a whole lot of story, but then again, that's what the notes and documents are for. But I like looking at these games this way because it just kind of gives you a whole other perspective on things. So those of you that are curious like I am with some of these games and these types of characters, there actually is quite a lot of backstory with them. But anyway, like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope this helped you guys understand more of the background of the Outlast characters. But once again, if you did enjoy, please hit the like button. If you guys new to my channel, subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video.